I'm going to be teaching on what I try to pass your test. I've been telling your neighbor, say, pass your test. Okay, let's, let's say it loud and clear like you mean it. In fact, say like a preacher would say, look at someone and say, pass your test. Hallelujah, all right? So the, the title of my message came, comes from, you know, what was happening yesterday. It seemed as if in this series of meetings, God wants to shape us, transform us, so that we can take possession of what lies ahead of us. In fact, let's do something. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Mueller. That was such a beautiful, powerful message. Hallelujah. God is working a walk within us to change us, transform us so that we can receive. You, you see, uh, a lot of times that when we're asking God, do something. God, do this. God has already done what he needs to do. It's us positioning right so that we can receive what God has done. Like be in the right position. So that we can receive what God has done. A lot of times when we say, uh, we're saying, God bless me. And then we say, God pour out the rain. And then God is pouring out the rain. Then you put up an umbrella and say, no, it's not, I'm not going to get wet. And doing that is the actions we take. The things that we do are those things that, you know, we are unnecessarily shielding ourselves from the influence of God. And so yesterday, Dr. K was talking, and uh, this morning, you know, all these instructions coming. And so God, I mean, I mean, in, in these teachings, I want us to see certain things uh, that will help us experience God, His manifestations, the things that He has prepared for us. Let me tell you about one more time, say, pass your test. All right, there are two types of tests. There are tests and trials. Temptations of the devil. How many of you know about that? You've heard about that? How many of you have faced something in your life? Okay. We are very we, we are aware of that. Are the devil is a tempter. The Bible calls the devil a tempter. Look at Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Matthew 4, 3. He says, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. The devil is the tempter. The end of the temptation is to get us to say, Hey, God is not a good God. To say, I'm not even serving him again. That's why the devil brings the temptation. He's not bringing the temptation to see if you are... He wants to destroy. That's, that's why he brings it. The storms that we experience, the challenges that come from the devil, they are meant to destroy us and get to a place where we say, okay, you know what? I'm not following God again. God is... That's, that's the same. He's the tempter. Look, look, look at another scripture. Look at, look at 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the enemy, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Is the adversary, is the tempter, is the devil. He wants to discredit God. He wants to destroy us. Those tests and temptations don't come from God. Let me tell you, neighbor, say they don't come from God. In fact, I, I, we'll get into this. Number two, the type, second type of test that we face, test of obedience of faith. So there are tests and trials from the devil. There are tests of obedience of faith. These tests are opportunities for us to demonstrate character and dependence on God and express our God nature. Those kind of tests. When someone does something bad to you and then something, and then you have an opportunity to do something bad to them. And then you say, mm, I will not get even. That's a test of obedience of faith. Instead of getting even, you love them. You help them. You know, you know, you know when Jesus Christ came and started preaching, he said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, I mean, an eye for an eye is, is good. Amen? Somebody took out your hand and then you're waiting like, okay, now I need to say. He said, no, that's that. But I come to tell you, if somebody curses you, bless them. If they despitefully use you, pray for them. If they slap you on the right, what did he say? Turn the other cheek. Someone said, ah, no, my, my mama didn't give back to a fool. <laughs> okay? It says, if they, if, they make, if they force you to go one mile, he said, ask them, do you want us to go too? If they take your jacket, they say, do you want the, do you want the shirt too? <laughs> Jesus Christ came. And when we face trials like that, there are opportunities for us to demonstrate our obedience to God, our love for God, and our commitment to God. Hallelujah. You see, when trials and trials come, a lot of times we, we think that God is, let me say this, see, God doesn't really test us. God is omniscient. He knows everything. So he's not testing us to see uh, whether or not we will pass. 
it's opportunities for us to develop character. So when those, let me tell you, when those opportunities come, say, take the opportunity. Hallelujah. So take the opportunity. When you're in church, and then you're going to write your offering and say, you know, Dr. K was saying this yesterday, write $10,000. That's an opportunity to demonstrate our dependence on God. Test and trials. They are the things that help us show our faithfulness to God. When opportunity comes like this, we take an, it's, it's an opportunity to demonstrate character and dependence on God. That I trust God. You know, a lot of people, what, I mean, you see, we can say, I trust God. But when the robber meets the road, how many of you remember Peter? He said, even if they all deny you, I will be here standing. Amen. What happened? He denied Jesus. How many times? Maybe the first one, it, it didn't really mean it. There was an opportunity again. He said, I, I'm not. The third time, he said, are you, are you mad? I said, I'm not. I don't know him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. All right. Listen, child of God, we're equipped to handle the tests that come away. Come and say, I'm equipped to handle the tests that come away. You know, the Bible says, it will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but with the temptation, will provide a way of escape. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 to 13. And so, when we have these tests come to us, you know, Dr. K was saying yesterday, God puts money in your account. It's an opportunity. Come and say, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness. God took the nation of Israel out of Egypt. When they were living, he said, go to your neighbors and borrow. Get your wages back. And then they got into the wilderness. You know where he took them? The wilderness. There are no malls in the wilderness. They didn't need the money. In fact, the Bible says, how I took you in this wilderness 40 years and you lack nothing. Hey, say, God will take care of me. So God doesn't need our money to take care of us. God doesn't need, God can take care of us. And so he put the world in their hands. They got into the wilderness. He said, ah, come and build me a temple. Everyone whose heart moves you. Come and build me a temple. God will put things in our hands and give us opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness and commitment to him. And when he puts those things in our hands, these things are helping us develop character. God is saying, if you are faithful in little, then I will put much in. Look, look at it. Can, can, we, can we have that Luke chapter 16? Luke 16, 10 to 13. It says, he that is faithful in that which is little is faithful also in much. So I said, don't worry. When I have a lot of money, I'll start giving. Uh, no, you're not going to give. If you can't give $5, $10 now, the day... I mean, and, and what, what's, what's, the, what's the tithe of $100? $10? What's the tithe of $1,000? If you can't give $100 now, the day $200,000 come into your hand, what's the tithe? $20,000. You'll be like, ah, no, Pastor Moe, doesn't need that money? So, ah, church, 20, what do they need? <laughs> but if you are faithful, in 5, in 10, in 20, there's coming a time God can put 200 a million dollars because he knows you've been faithful in little and that's these opportunities that God gives us so that we with those, with those opportunities we can start developing character so you've been given the tithe it doesn't matter if the money is not I will give my tithe I honor God with my tithe the day a huge amount drops it, does, it doesn't shake you why? because you've become you, you've developed the muscle you've developed the character you've developed the strength to be able to say yes this is what I'll do and so God can say, okay, send that funds into his hand because I need to get funds into the hands of my people. I know, you know what the Bible said about Abraham? He said, for I know Abraham. Abraham, when God said, Abraham, leave your father's house. He left. I mean, it's one thing for, for, for you to hear a voice to say, start going. He said, where? He said, start going. He started going. One day he said, Abraham, take now your son. Uh, in case he thought it was Ishmael, your only son. And then Isaac, and, and to, to really put it in, whom you love, take your car, your only car that you like. You say, I bind the devil. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. One, one, of, one of my pastors was telling me how years ago, God blessed him. He said, he had, he had one car. He, he had one car, one car. A very good car. And he used to have two, three cars. He said, he had one car. He said, God said, um, 
you know that minister? The minister was like four states over. He said, go take your car and give to He said, God, I used to have several cars. Now I have one car, my only car. And then you want me to take it several states. So he said he took it to the several states, drove several states, God gave it to the man of God. He said, that man didn't need the car. That man has too many cars. He said, the man got in the car and started driving it. Called him and said, I've driven your car for a week. The man doesn't even drive. He has a driver. He said, but I've driven your car for a week. He's thinking, God, okay, you must be up to something because it's my only car. He said, in those moments, God blessed him. The vision that, apparently maybe he's been spending too much time in the car. <laughs> so he stayed at home. And do you know what? Sometimes the harvest of the, I mean, the rewards of our obedience don't show up in two weeks. It doesn't show up in two years. But we live to obey him. And so when these tests come, there are opportunities for us to develop character. Hallelujah. Let me say four things about tests so to clear this. Number one, God doesn't test us with evil. You see, it's, it's shocking the amount of Christians that have a sneaky suspicion that does, God does evil sometimes. They say, God is a good God. They say, that preacher is preaching heresy. And they're so quick to label things heresy. If you check God's word, God says over. Let, let, let's look at scriptures. Look at jo James 1 from 13 to 17. James chapter 1 verse 13 to 17. Okay. And I want us to read it together. James chapter 1 verse 13 to 17, okay? In case you don't believe what's on the screen, read your Bible yourself, okay? At least you brought that one from your house, okay? Let's, let's, let's read it. Are you ready? One, read. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he <laughs> animal. Okay, give me the new King James, okay? Old King James, at least we are... <laughs> okay, all right? It says... God cannot be tempted with evil by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God doesn't see, I have a flu, a big head, God is tempting me. No, God doesn't tempt people with evil. Say, you know, I, I, I used to think growing up that it's a known fact that God is a good God until I met some Christians. And you have to dig in the word. Next verse. Look at the next verse. Next verse 14. It says, But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Next verse. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Next, go on. Do not be deceived. Just in case you have that thought. Don't be deceived. God my beloved brethren, God doesn't do evil. He now says, every good gift and every perfect gift, just so that you know, every good gift. I mean, when people say, oh, God gave me cancer. I mean, if you have kids, do you line up your kids in the morning? Say one, two, three. Pastor, you have three, right? And that's all. Uh, okay. <laughs> like you have three and you say, hey, number one. Take a heavy slap so that we learn very well in school today. Frosha! Say number two, bring me a knife. Let's cut. So, if we natural fathers who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more God? Why would God give us cancer to teach us everything? I would say, ah, I, I say, uh, Pastor, have you read, you read the scripture? It says, Is there evil in the land and I did not do it? Okay, let, let me just tell you this, okay? Uh, this, this is a very long teaching, okay? But, but let, let's, let's just take a, take a little detour, okay? Listen. If I, I can give you, give you another one scripture that people use. Say, An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. <laughs> okay, when it comes to interpreting scriptures, there's a common thing. When you see a thing in scripture, there's a, there's a common thing. And when you read about it, and when you see an anomaly, then you need to, like, pause and consider. When you look through... The, the, the Bible, you see where Cain killed Abel and God said it was evil, right? You've read scriptures where it says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You read scriptures like, uh, like uh, God, uh, the thief comes to steal but to kill and to destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And so in looking at that, you see that, oh, oh there's, an, there's an anomaly there. And that gives you an, okay, all right, why is this there? A lot of times, um, the scriptures that we read like that are scriptures that are written from the perspective of those people in the Old Testament. 
that says an evil spirit came from the Lord. But if you look in the New Testament, you see God, Jesus as the, mani- I mean, Jesus as the manifestation of God. Remember when, when the disciples said, let us call fire down from heaven because some people didn't receive Jesus. Say, let us call fire down. I, <laughs> and you said, what? What? Don't you know they could do it? That's why they said, let us do it. They could have called fire and Jesus said, Jesus didn't say, oh, you couldn't do it. He said, what? Don't you know what manner of spirit you are? He rebuked them. God doesn't do it. Let me tell you about it. Don't be deceived. Oh, okay. you're not saying it. You're not saying like it. Say, don't be deceived. You know, this morning, I saw on Facebook, one of the pastors I follow, he says, Pastor, what about Job? He said, number one, is your name Job? <laughs> and then he went on to explain it. So, oh, God can, God can touch your life. I mean, God can touch your wife. I can touch your children. I mean, I wonder what Job's children are thinking about. God, you killed me because you were... <laughs> Let me tell them, I say, God doesn't do evil. Oh, you're not saying like, you know, say God doesn't do evil. Okay, don't worry. It's, um, it's, it's, sometimes it takes time to sink. Because we've been, we've been hearing it, God will get you. In fact, in the language... Of the country where my wife comes from originally, I'm, I'm from. I'm from America. My wife is from. When something happens, say God caught you. <laughs> How? <laughs> you know, imagine, imagine me, me eating pasta or something, and then I'm running away because I do, and then I run into the door. Boom! Say God caught you. God is not involved. <laughs> Let me tell you, I say God doesn't do evil. Okay, all right. So unfold your hands now and then laugh. Eh? Say like, Pastor, God does evil. He killed my neighbor that God does. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you there? This Are you still with me this morning? God doesn't do evil. Okay. That's the first thing. Number two things about tests. Tests show or reveal who we are and where we stand. It shows our level of faith. It shows our competency. It shows where we need strength. It shows where we need to develop. Hallelujah. So when a test comes and you fail the test, don't worry. There's another opportunity to take it again. Now, don't intentionally fail the test. (laughs) But if you fail the test, huh? there's another opportunity. Don't let guilt and shame like Pastor Muiwa preached put you down. Say, I'm resigning now. I'm not going to be king again. I did something with Bathsheba. I killed her husband. No, no, God made him king. In fact, God showed up. He said, choose. I want to... (laughs) Should I punish you or should I let men punish you? He said, ah, God, men, they don't have mercy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you are God hey, I mean why would David be a man after God's heart the man knows how to confess his fault and he knows how to move on his son died they said ah, you are fasting that is not, is, I did not, his son is now dead he said you stood up he said ah, he's dead what else let's move on <laughs> he knows how to move on he knows how to over, walk away from guilt and shame not letting anything pull him down Tests and trials show our strength Okay, if listen, child of God, if you have been learning about walking in love, walking in patience, and somebody does something and then you lose it, you kick them, and then you know, like Pastor Dr. K said, Yes, you did mighty ego and Bill Mascara for them. <laughs> when Dr. K said, I'm like, Where did that come from? <laughs> you know, and you beat them up. Okay, there's another opportunity for you next time not to do that. Don't say, I'm not coming to church again. You know, I once had a church member, I mean, she, le- she got born again, but she didn't live the whole life. When she goes on vacation, she's gone. <laughs> she goes on, she just takes a six week and then, you know, he's sleeping around galore. She's gone. And when she comes back, I'm like, six weeks, she's come back. Where is she? She's not in church. <laughs> I'll go to her house. Jesus still loves you. <laughs> it's not what you did, it's what Jesus did. Okay, so come back to church. She will cry with tears. And, you know, so I started helping her. So when she wants to say, I'm going for six, I'm like, ah, no, I think two weeks, two and a half weeks is enough. She'd be like, Okay, okay. And then she started doing that. There was one time when somebody said me, said, Pastor, why are you, are you trying to control her? I said, keep, your, keep quiet. You don't know. You're not, you, there's no, you, don't, <laughs> you don't know what's going on here. But you know what? She got to a place where she could go on vacation and come back and nothing happened. Hallelujah. And so when we, when we go through trust and trials, it's an opportunity to develop. It's an opportunity to go to the next level. Hallelujah. The challenges we face. And I mean, when they come, you know what? Don't think, why me? God, why? What, should, should it be Pastor Muiwa? Eh? Say, so give it to the pastor. No? <laughs> Are you here this morning? 
All right, Proverbs 24, verse 10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the tricks of the devil, the wise. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Come on, step Tell your neighbor, say, take on the armor of God. Be ready. Be ready. Because when the temptation shows up, say, let me go and put on the armor. It might be too late then. Amen. Praise God. Live ready. Number three, tests give us opportunity to develop character and endurance. James 1 verse 2 to 4. Can you look, look at it? James 1 verse 2 to 4. Let's look at this. I really need us to see this. Look at it. We're going to come back to that, that thing you showed just now. This, the slide you showed. Blessed is the man that endures. Temp- Can you give me the New King James Version? I don't want to be endured and delivered and uh, tempted. Okay? All right? It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love. Come on, say, there's a crown for me. Come on, come on, church. I can't hear you. Say, there's a crown for me. So when, when the challenges come, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to go to the next level. It's an opportunity to, to receive the reward. Hallelujah. Listen, you know, when I was years ago in ministry, there was a man of God that said something. He said, he's noticed that whenever the devil attacks him, God will say, keep quiet. So, and when that season has gone, he said, there's always a reward that will show up. He said they will attack him, they will print lies, they will take a clip and take it out of context, and everybody will start. In fact, those kind of attacks now have magnified with social media, you know, Twitter, people. Everybody will take a clip and then magnify it. Imagine a, a preacher was once saying, He said, Just imagine if I live my life wrong, right? And I sleep with uh, 300 women. They put it there, I sleep with 300 women. <laughs> Just that clip. The daughter said, I'm going to sue you. God said, Mm-mm. don't worry. I'll defend you. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And you know what? In that space, you develop character. God says, keep quiet. Don't say anything. And do what God will fight for you. You know, there's a man of God. He said, every time he goes through that kind of a thing, he said, God always rewards him. He said, the last one he went through, he said, God gave him a lifetime income. I'm like, what's a lifetime income? He said, God gave him an idea. He put the idea in motion. He said, even when he's dead, that idea is generating money. Then God said, this is your reward. Come and say, there's a reward for me. And so, we need to get to this place where we endure temptation because it develops character. It gives us reward. Hallelujah. Romans 5, 3 to 4. It says, we rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. That I'm reading the New Living Translation. And endurance develops strength of character. And character senses our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. But we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Challenges develop character. Hallelujah. Tests bring promotion. Okay? We've seen this. That James 1, 12. Okay? I was reading this James 1, 12 there. It says, James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown. Okay? First Peter 1, 7. Uh, all of those things are scripture. Okay? Now, I want to quickly go. My time is running up. Four kind of tests that you must pass. Let me tell you about say four kind of tests. Oh, church. Are you, are you here? I can't hear you. Come and say four kinds of tests that you must pass. Let me look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. I wanted to preach it to him. Say, neighbor, four kinds of tests that you must pass. Number one, pass the test of obedience. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? If Jesus is Lord, then I will honor him by obeying him. If Jesus is Lord of my life, I will honor Jesus by obeying him. So when I see something in the world, I don't say that is, you know, for somebody else. Listen listen to this. You see, I always say this uh, when I'm preaching around this. All of us have opinions. Anybody has has opinions about certain things here? Hello? You have opinions about the, what's the, what makes the best meal, the best holiday, the best hotel, the best political candidate, everything about life. You have an opinion. And it's good. That's the way God made us. 
But when we get to God's word, our opinion submits. If I'm ever in the same space with you and you say, I don't care what God's, the Bible says, this is my opinion. I, I, I'll, I'll take 10 steps back from you. And like Dr. K said yesterday, I will discharge myself from your space or discharge you from my space. Because the, de- the, <laughs> the, the Bible is what we follow. We, we, we do what God's word says. We don't exalt our opinion above God's word. God's word is final authority in my life. When I see it in the word, I will do it. Hallelujah. Are you with me this morning? Obey the word of God. Obey. And it starts from obeying what, is, what you find in the word, written word. And walk in love as Christ loved us. Okay, so walk in love. Honor the Lord with your substance. Honor the Lord with your substance. Obey the written word. So a lot of people say, God, tell me, show me. But the one that he has shown us already in the word, we are not obeying that. And we want more instructions. Obey what is spoken, to, what, what God has said. And when God speaks to us, obey what he has said to us. Okay, let me, let me say a few things. Obey instantly without hesitation. Let me tell you, let me say obey instantly. And do you know what? When we're in services like this, we, we start, that's the way God starts training us. When in services, we're in service, we're worshiping God. And God says, go, in, go on your knees. You'll be like, what will people think of me? Listen, obey. That's where it starts. Lay down and worship me. You're like, wow. They will think I'm hyper, hyper spiritual. Obey God. It doesn't have anything to do with anybody. So the same way you've learned to obey him, hearing him in church. One day you get in your car, God says, don't go through that route. Because you've learned to obey, you will go. And then you get home, they're like, oh, something happened on that route. Like, why didn't you go through that route? That's your... He said, God told me. Why? Because in church, we've been trained. We've learned to recognize his voice. We've learned to obey him. Obey the written word. Obey his promptings. Obey without delaying. And God says, hey, can you do this for me? You say, yes, God, I will do it. Um, I may be 2027 based on my plan. God will go, please, can you help me do this? And in 2027, when you get up, God, I'm ready. God says, okay, I have another assignment. That one has been done already. I mean, I want to be the guy that when God says, we need to get something done quickly. Okay, go on, go on, tell. He will do it quickly. Not the word. I mean, God says, if you tell him now, he's going to start making plans. He'll be ready in 2032. So let's quickly go and tell the person that we'll do it tomorrow. Come and say, I obey instantly. Obey without grumbling. You know, some people obey God, but they grumble all through it. Obey without God. When you see that your heart is grumbling, just stop. And you just say, and you know what? It doesn't take time to change all this attitude. You just be like, God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited to do your will. See, my feelings will catch up. But I've made a decision. Obey instantly. Obey without complaint. Obey without adding or subtracting from it. I remember Dr. Kefrodola was preaching one day. He said somebody came into his house and God said, give him your black suit. He had this black suit. So he said he went upstairs and took something else that was not the black suit and gave it to him. And the guy was like, wow, thank you. He said he felt inside him. God said, no, that's not it. So he went back and got two other suits and gave it to the guy. The guy said, whoa, thank you. And then he's like, then he went and got one. He said, God, four is it's greater than one. God said the black suit. So he went eventually and gave the guys. He said, the guy said, five suits. He said, he wanted to collect the other ones and said, it's only one. <laughs> Obey without adding to it or subtracting from it. Just do, let me tell you, say, just do what God says. Okay. Obedience shows our trust. Proverbs 6.23. It says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Reproofs or instructions are the way of life. You see, when we say, so I'm following God's plan. That's how to follow God's plans. God says, turn right, turn left. A lot of, a lot of times you think a destination is God's plan. No, it's not, it's not just a destination. There might be destinations involved. But there are lots of things of obedience on the pathway of purpose. I say, I'm waiting for that day when I will stand in my purpose. The day is now. When we start obeying from now. Let me tell you, never say, obey, obey, obey the Lord. So pass your test of obedience. Someone said, it is, someone, <laughs> he said uh, to Saul, he said, it is better to obey. I mean, be able to obey is better than sacrifice and to eat than the fat of rams. Number two test, pass the test of love. Pass the test of love. Let me tell you this. Listen, child of God, this one, this test, love of, I mean, test of love. Maybe it's the reason why some prayers are not answered. Our faith won't work if we don't work in love. You know, as a pastor, I'm very, 
this is this is constant. I need to make sure I get out of that mode. If somebody does something, and you have opportunities for people, ministers here, leaders here, leaders, you have you're leading people. There are several opportunities for you to get offended with people. Several. The many more people you lead, the many more opportunities. Come and say it's an opportunity. Right? The many more opportunities you have. And once, if you get into that mode, you know, I was having a conversation with Pastor May and Dr. K. And we're talking about, sometimes pastors get to this place where they are bitter. And they start talking about haters. And the whole message, like, Pastor, what, what's happening? People have died that's with them and they're in a place where they're in pain and they're hurt and pastors do get hurt and in pain but don't allow what people do to get you to walk out of love same thing say love gives love forgives those are the two things in fact when I see that I have a challenge with someone you know what I go and look for a gift to give them just to tell my feelings that this is not what we are doing. Don't say, oh, forgive and forget. Sometimes you, you remember for life. In fact, when you see certain things, you remember what they did. But you choose to walk in love. You said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's not how big a Bible we carry. It's not how many tongues or how long we can speak in tongues. It's not how the t- song tongue si- sounds. Say, my tongue sounds freneto sananta sita. Eh? It's like refined tongues. It's not. (laughs) Hallelujah. John chapter 4 verse 7 to 8. It says, Beloved, let us not love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. Bottom line. He that does not love. It says, if you you claim to love God that you have, James is very practical. He says, if you claim to love the God that you have not seen and you hate your brother that you see, it says, how dwells the love of God within you? And you know, Mark eleven twenty five. 25, it says, if you do not forgive men their sins, neither will you ever, I'm like, ah, God. He goes against my theology. If you confess our sins, it's straight and just to forgive us. You know, one day I was listening to someone, he said, if you refuse to forgive, he said, you're in, perpe- you're in perpetual disobedience. God looks at you. He says, it just blows the manifestation of God from your life. Because that disobedience is like, you're putting up you're putting up a tent. This is not, this is not an obela. It's a tent. Like you're putting up a tent. And when you come out like, maybe I should forgive them. God is trying to bless you. You run back under the tent like, God, don't, don't bless me. Disobedience. I mean, sorry. Unforgiveness stops the manifestations of God in our lives. Let me tell you about say, pass the test of love. Number three, pass the test of attitude. I'm rushing here. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Are you sure that clock is correct? I'm going to make it. Pass the attitude test. This one is big. Years ago, I had this cute saying. Attitude determines altitude. I'm like, wow, it's so cute. It was as if that was my enrollment in attitude, cl- attitude school. My goodness, I got some knocks. Attitude determines altitude. How many of you remember Joseph? Joseph, Dr. K was talking about Joseph. He was just a teenager that thought he knew everything. He said, Dad, sit down. Mom, sit down. Everybody come around. Brothers come around. He said, you're going to bow to me. You are go- I have a vision. I have a dream. One day, I'll be sitting and you all will be bound to me. He said, by the time he went through all the challenges he went through, and he came to the palace. And they said, we heard that you can interpret it. He said, no, the Lord will give. <laughs> the Lord will give you the interpretation. Attitudes. What's your attitude towards leadership? Hey, I've, I've, seen, some, I've seen God enroll people in, in attitude class. And you know what? He will just give you a pastor that, you know, just, it's as if they are conf- Like, what did I do to you? I'm going to leave your church. And then you get up because God says, get up. Go to church. Say, I'm not coming to that church again. <laughs> sometimes, an attitude, sometimes you don't, you, don't, you don't take care of rough edges until you fire those rough edges. Fire those. And so you, are, you keep butting heads with your boss at work. <laughs> we, had, we had a lady in church once. Man, she was a gift. She could sing. But she had a rotten attitude. Like super rotten attitude. 
So I, I, I was in church office. This was years ago. I, and so they asked me that, oh, you know, can you help us in church office? And so I would go to the church office and she was supposed to be a staff there. Now, that fired her from several jobs. <laughs> so, so the pastor said, okay, all right. At least you sing in church, come to the church office and, you know, work. You know, we, we need people and then we'll pay you. Our first week, I lie not, our first week, she got three queries. Three queries. Queries, I mean, you know, church, church office now, we are Christians, we are believers. You hardly get one. You might, you might be in church office 20 years, I don't get one. She got three queries. At the end of the week, pastor said, okay, you know what, what's our pastor? <laughs> not Dr. Kenner, our pastor. He said, you know what, I think you shouldn't come to the church office again. <laughs> you from church office. Church office, the bar, the, the bar is so low, you just be born again and be a member of the church. <laughs> said, okay, alright, you know what, don't come here again. And you know, for years you didn't change. But God got on her case. The choir, I mean, she was the choir, you know, how many of you watch football matches when they say, is the team? Uh -huh. She's, she can sing. She will sing and then she will back herself up, trying to ginger those people up and then she will sing and leap. She was good. But she had a rotten attitude. But she wasn't changing. You know what happened? I traveled. I came back one day. I said, where is she? They said, she's there. She's in the choir. I said, in the, where? Where? She was at the back. And there were beautiful singers in front. That's the way she learned. I mean, all of a sudden, she, she found out that God has... I, I, I pray I, I am not in that place. God says, okay, all right, you know what? Let's, let's let him rest. Let's bench him for a while. <laughs> I think it's a good place to say, may God not bench you. She was benched. I'm like, where is she? The choir just grew. The choir was now like 60 people. And when they were leading worship, I'm like, I'm out. These people are beautiful. And I said, where is she? They said, she's there. Where? She was at the back. God has many children. He said, start. Start the work. He'd be like, no, God. Uh, based on timing, based on, we will start. God, they say, start now. I don't have all the money. Listen, child of God, when God says, move, move. I've learned, I've learned to move. I'm a pastor. We look at the accounts and say, we're not going to do this program based on natural thinking. We're not, I was talking to a friend of mine last week. So he was saying something and he said, we have not even paid, we have not even paid the finish paying the rent for last month. I said, I said I'm better than you. He said, what? <laughs> I said, me, I've paid all my rent. <laughs> Pass your test. Let me tell you about say pass your test. Pass your test. Pass the test of obedience. Pass the attitude test. If you have the wrong attitude, you know some people have the wrong attitude about prosperity. You can't, you can't despise prosperity and expect to be prosperous. What we despise, we cannot attract into our lives. Don't join them on Facebook. That preacher, that man, is, he has, he has. Look, you can't despise it and expect to find expression in your life. It won't. It won't happen. Attitude towards the body of Christ. Never be, the body of Christ is not perfect. Jesus didn't say we are perfect people. That's why he died for us. And he's continually washing us with the water by the word to present up to himself. Don't join them. Say, the church, the church, the church will fix this road. I mean, the church is not everything. The church will fix the sky, fix the road, fix the... Don't, don't criticize the body of Christ. Don't criticize prayer. All the people that pray like this, <laughs> what is wrong? What's your home? Come and say, I'm a member of the body of Christ. Say, I'm 100% a member of the body of Christ. So don't criticize, don't criticize your family. Are we perfect? No. <laughs> you know, I have, I have some of the policies I have for pastors and leaders under me. Listen, if you go on social media and you start arguing, we will deal with it. Look, just, just go walk by. You don't have to comment on any silliness going on. So I want to set them right. Uh, don't worry. No, my wife told me something. He said, he said when, you, when, you, when you're commenting on social media and people are fighting, he said, like, it's like you're going by a house and you see a dog back and you go by there and say, woo, woo, and then the dog is back. He said, <laughs> pass the, uh, the attitude test. Pass the attitude test. I've had some members in church that you know, I've never reported anybody to God, but there's this scripture. It says, it says, it says that uh, 
give double honor to your leaders, uh, to your pastors, those who labor in the world. He said, because, uh, and then do it so that they may give, because they have to give account. They may do it so joyfully. If they don't do it joyfully, I've not reported anybody to God, but I've prayed for people like God. Amen. Let me tell you, anybody say, grow up. <laughs> you know, Dr. K, Dr. K propounded a theory once. He said, when oh, you have this challenge, he said, two things might be going on. He said, first, is it that they missed the home training that they should have gotten from home? Now, pastor has to do the home training or there's a mental health issue. I just started, I just, he said, mental health issue, how? <laughs> but are you getting blessed this morning? Hallelujah. Pass the attitude test. He says, look, look at it. James 4, 6. But he gives more grace, therefore says, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Okay? Have the right attitude towards God's word. Have the right attitude towards the church, towards spiritual things. Don't downplay spiritual things. Don't make fun of spiritual things. Amen? Have the right attitude towards leadership. Have a can-do attitude. Oh, we want to have so-so-so-so. said, Pastor, it's not possible. It can never be possible. Ah, what? Have a can Pastor, yes, we make it work. What do we need to do? Have a can-do attitude. Have a yes attitude. I can do all things through Christ. So, so, don't be in the party of no. Say, oh, we should pray. No. We should pray more in church. No, we are praying enough. Midweeks have No. Online meeting. No. And just in the party of no. What, what, okay, what, do, okay. <laughs> what do you want to say yes to? Number four, pass the money test. You cannot serve God and serve mama. A lot of times you say, oh, no, I'm not serving mama. I'm serving God. But we can, we can measure things. I mean, someone said, you are not in my heart. But I can, we can measure what is in your heart by what is on the outside that you do. We can measure it by where you spend your time. Amen? Social media. How many hours did you spend in the world? How many hours did you spend? And you know what? There's a conditioning going on in our world. People, I mean, all the things we are hearing on social media, you don't know, but it's conditioning us. And the things you expose yourself to, oh, you, very soon you crack some jokes, you'll be like, is that me? Why? Because you're getting accustomed to those things. A believer should spend time in the word. Pass the money test. Where does your money go? If you check your bank account. What's Dr. K saying? Not, not strong. 200. Nostrum, 300. Nostrum, 100. Nostrum, 500. Walmart, 200. Uh, what's that? Tom, Tim Hortons or Tom? Okay. 200. King's Work Cadre, $1. <laughs> we can know where it goes. Don't serve God. You cannot serve God and serve mammon. Look at it. <clears throat> Whatever gets attention... Can I have that slide? Whatever. Next, next slide. Let's, next slide. The next slide. Media. <laughs> yeah. Let's read it together. Let's read it. One read. Is in control. Whatever gets our attention. You know, a lot of times people think they're in control of their lives. In fact, God doesn't want you to be in control. He says, let me lead you. Because we think that if we're in control and charge of our lives, we'll, we'll do it well. No, 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 no. The best way to live, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. We don't want to relinquish control, but we don't know that some other things are controlling us. Some people get a job and they're like, oh, buy it. I mean, there's a big house and a big job. No taxes are low. That's where I'm moving to. Some people are controlled by the weather. It's cold here. It's warmer there. Some people are controlled by taxes. The taxes here. No, no, what is God saying? We cannot serve God and serve mammon. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Pass the money test. Listen, let me say this to you. God will put resources in your hands. And he has done it too many times. He gave it to Abraham. And he said, Abraham, give me. He gave it to the nation of Israel. He said, give me. God will put resources in your hands. And he will say, give. Listen, the devil never tells, will never tell you to give church money. Never. Okay, so let's get that out. Say, is it me? Is it God? Is it the devil? The devil and you, you don't live in the same house. You're, you're, 
So when you are sitting there and God says, write a check of $20,000, it's not the devil. The devil is not interested in funding the kingdom of God. Is it me? We know it's not you. You rather do. <laughs> it's God. Pass the test of mammon. When God puts in your hand and you start every, every time money comes into your hand, I honor the Lord with my substance. This is my 10%. This is my offering. And I, I'm, I'm giving to God. I'm giving to God. You are passing that test. And you know what? Some finances will come into your hands. In fact, sometimes God will put, I mean, God will give you opportunities. There are opportunities. There's a project going on. Look at David. I mean, I don't know if you remember David. David was living in his own house and he had, he has built his house. He had won many wars. Everything was fine. And then he called Nathan the prophet. He said, Nathan, come. He said, I'm living in a good house. I'm living in this beautiful place. The presence of God lives in a tent. Listen, some people say, God didn't tell me. God didn't have to tell David. With all the evil he had done, God said, Nathan, go back. Nathan was still walking. God said, go back. He said, I have never asked anyone to do it. He came into your heart. He said, ah, you will never cease to have a son on it. That's how his lineage was established. He said, even when your descendants misbehave, I will punish them, but you will never cease to have a descendant on the throne. I don't know if you remember when they were calling Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. That's, exact, that's what, what happened there. Our gifts, our, our, our consecration to God. I put in, you see, when, when people start saying, oh, you know, Christianity is not attached to your money. Ah, it's phony. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And God does that continually. He says, my house lies in ruins. You are building your house. Now get wood and build the house. Let me take delight in it. And I will pour out for you a blessing. He says, a man honors his father. He said, if I be a father, where is my honor? He said, God, when what? He says, when you offer the blind and the lame, the things you don't need. Some of us can sit down and eat a meal of $300 in a restaurant with our friends. When we come to church, we think $10 is the only, one, only good thing to give to God. And you know what? I mean, someone said, Pastor, you shouldn't say, I would say that it's part of my job. You see, long ago, I, I left this shame. I said, will you serve in the choir? I said, I'm not. I'll come back two months later. Maybe God has spoken to you now. You have changed. I will keep asking. I mean, if I can ask you for your life, I can I ask you for your money too? God has sent me to ask people, ask them to give their lives. I mean, your life is greater than your money, unless you think your money is greater than your life. I, mean, I don't have a problem. God, speak to them. I will stand there and I will declare to them, listen, child of God, pass the money test. It's a major test. Walking in love, major test. Obedience, major test. You see, these things can make the difference between life and death. And ministers, listen, if you're a minister here, you lead people. These decisions that you make doesn't just affect your life. It affects others attached to you. And so for that sake, you need to consecrate. It's double consecration. You know, Dr. K was talking about, you know, God taking some people home. And God will say, oh, all right, come on. Pastors ought to live long because, I mean, we are serving God. Our, our company takes care of us. There's security. But when things start going wrong, when you, derail, when, you, when you derail your train by disobedience, you're outside of coverage area. There's no coverage area. There's no, there's no network there. I say, oh, it's God. No, it's not God. God will do his best. God will send angels. But if we still keep like... And you know, God doesn't force anything on people. He says, I said before, you life and death. Choose life. He says, choose life. This is the good one. Choose it. But it's your choice. He said, no, I want to choose this other one. God doesn't force us. Let me tell you, never say, pass your test. Have you been blessed this morning? Yes, Let's rise up on our feet and we're going to say a word of prayer for a few minutes. If you had something, you need to adjust something. You need to change something in your life. No, don't worry. It's not, oh, a little bit. No, no, no. Just godly. I mean, repentance what, what, what does that thing? Godly repentance brings sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance. Okay, just talk to God. Lord, I change. It doesn't take too much. I make an adjustment. I forgive. I walk in love. I obey what you said to me. Nekosunanta. God says relocate from a city to another city. Just do it. Because God's provision will be waiting for you there. Let's talk to God. Can you come a little higher? Mm -hmm, I will never be the same again I will never read on I've closed that door I will walk the path I'll run the race and I will never be the same again 
and I will never be the same again. Come on, talk to God this morning and make your commitment to Him. Hey, shatatata. Such a sweet presence of God in this place to bring about a change, to bring about a transformation. Someone says, I need strength. Receive strength right now. God, how will I do this? Receive strength right now. Nekusinanto goshishe. Neburu babo sokoto brahakatuso. Nekoshunanto didi dado sokoto breekadoso. Lekoshenem braandiagasoso. Lekoshanande ekato sokoto breekadoso. Lord, we thank you for your grace that is released upon us. Thank you because that grace helps us position right so that we can receive from you so that your will, your workings, your power can be manifest in our lives. And so we yield to you this afternoon. Have your way. We receive from you.